Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the senator for Gaithersburg in Rockville and the founder and host of Folk and Great Music in Rockville. With me today, my very special guest in Kibitzing with Kagan is Ron Olesko, a longtime leader in the music world and the founder and director of Folk Music Notebook. Ron, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Oh, thank you so much, Senator Kagan. It, it's so good to, uh, to to be here with you today. I've uh, I've all, I've long admired you. I've, I've I've known you for years in the in the folk world, and uh, you know I love the things that you're doing. And I think this is a great series. I've watched a couple of the episodes, and uh, I'm honored to be here. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, I look fo forward to this conversation, helping let folks know about what you do and all that you've done in your career. So nice. let's start, though, with your childhood. How did you get into music? Was there music in your home? Uh, how did you start? Well, uh, there was music in the home, but it wasn't. I mean, my parents weren't musicians. My mother would sing to me and uh, she would say she was saying off key, but you know, I can remember her singing around the house. And my dad used to listen to radio constantly. Uh, what, any kind of music, um, big band music or pop music of the day, he just loved to turn the radio on. And he worked as a custodian. I remember every, early mornings he would turn the radio on, trying to be quiet, but still loud enough that I could hear. And so I kind of absorbed that. And then I remember as a kid watching Captain Kangaroo on TV. This is during the, the folk revival. And he used to bring in all these great folk songs with his, with his puppets acting him out. So I kind of got absorbed in that. And then, of course, in, in, we had a great uh, music education in those days, which is something that's lacking in schools nowadays. But uh, I remember singing some of these great folk songs, which I didn't even know were folk songs yes. in, in grammar school. So it, it kind of started, started way back then. It was, the seed was planted. That's amazing. Um, who told you you had a voice for radio? How did you get started there? <laughs> well, they, they actually tell me I have a face for radio, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> I knew uh, you were going to go there. That's what I <laughs> uh, I can't. I can't. You, you throw a softball, I got to hit it, right? <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I, I always had a thing for radio, too. And in fact, I, I credit my dad for that. Um, you know, I remember when, when I was a kid, uh, a local radio station started replaying all these old time radio shows. And he told me, he goes, Ron, you got to listen to this. It's the shadow. I remember listening to this when I was young, you'll love it. So I tuned it in and I, th I thought it was amazing. You know, this whole theater of the mind thing with old time radio and, and then other series. And I remember sitting in my bedroom at night, I was actually making a playlist. So if I ran a radio station, here's how I would put these shows in order from all the old time stuff. So um, it, it became a thing. And I decided when I went to college, I wanted to join the radio station. Yeah. Uh, my first day of, of college in 1975, I went up the steps of WFDUFM in Teaneck, New Jersey, and I joined the station. And all these years later, I'm still there. And I'm three more credits and I can graduate. So I'm, you know. <laughs> 47 years with WFDU. Yeah. That's amazing. So WVKR, Vassar College Radio. Actually, uh -huh. I was a newscaster my freshman year, and then I had a radio show myself. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Curtain Call with Cheryl Kagan. It was Broadway musicals, actually. Uh-huh. Well, listen, really... if, if the Senator thing doesn't work out, we can talk. I can find you a slot in the folk music notebook. You know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so WFDU, tell me uh, what sort of radio you did there and what? how that morphed over 47 years. Well, it started out when I when I joined. It was into uh, alternative rock. You know, this was the early the mid '70s, yeah. and uh, the station had just gone on the air. Like, I think it was three years before I joined. Mm -hmm. So we were playing, you know, alternative rock. We were trying to be a non-commercial station, playing all these, you know, punk rock, early punk rock music. And I got to, to originally like yourself. I started doing news, did a, an old late night radio series where I could just do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I always had a thing for folk music. Um, you know, I remember in high school, my friend Bob and I, we would drive around in his Volkswagen. He loved Simon and Garfunkel and Bob Dylan. So that kind of got ingrained in me. So I started sneaking some of those kind of songs in there. And then I'll, I'll never forget the real turning point for me was back in 1978. Um, 77 i am i'm ter terrible on dates uh but the m movie woody guthrie's bound for glory came out mm -hmm. and uh i remember marjorie guthrie was uh in new york i read about her so i said you know what? i'm gonna see if i could do an interview with her so I, I i called up her committee to combat hunting disease which was a little organization that she started and uh she agreed to come over to the station and do an interview and 
Did just was, to interrupt for a second, Marjorie Guthrie is related to whom, how? Yes, she was the widow of Woody Guthrie. Thank uh, you. Who obviously is the, the godfather of folk music, really. Right. Uh, and that movie was you know, very popular. It was up for an Academy Award for cinematography and such. So she came to the station and she brought a, a musician with her, a guy named Tom Taylor, who was doing a one-man show as Woody Guthrie. Huh. And I was just so moved by her. You know, I, I kind of had a thing for Woody Guthrie and his music, but she was so inspiring to me. Oh um, and when we did that interview, I, I just got so much out of out of her personality and, and her drive. And it inspired me to continue to you know pursue folk music and pr pursue radio. I so mean, you I, have a photo of that interview. Why don't you share that? Really yeah, well? this so was this was taken in the studio that day um that's me with the, all that with hair. hair with the hair <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that is marjorie uh she was just an amazing woman and uh the interview luckily the recording was saved and it was actually used a few years ago excerpts from it in a book that was published about woody uh when he stayed at uh, graystone hospital when he was diagnosed with Huntington's disease he um he uh, was they, they were trying to figure out what was wrong with him and so he stayed at this hospital here in new jersey called graystone and uh, a, a photographer by the name of phil bueller did a book he went back to the ruins of this hospital actually found some of the archives of some paperwork that when woody was staying there and he put a whole book together and he used some excerpts from this uh, interview wow. with marjorie wow so, that's amazing you know. so have you ever been someone who has song played an instrument or written a song have i ever been that uh-huh no, no. I, I i play songs on the radio i, right, I can right, play right. a cd player okay. that's about it okay all right um, actually i take that back i do play a little bit of fiddle but nothing that anybody would ever want to hear I, I started that in grammar school okay well that's not something you can practice in the shower like some people say, well, <laughs> sing in the shower fiddle playing yeah. in the shower wouldn't work very well um so let's pivot to Folk Music Notebook. Yes. Uh, you launched it in 2019. What made you, what gave you the idea? How'd you come up with the name? Who were your early partners? You've got sure. a long list on your, on your website um, of early supporters, founding supporters, but like, right. how did you birth this amazing baby here? Well, it was something that was kind of percolating for a while. I, I, I started my folk show on FDU back in 1980. I had been with the station for a few years. I had graduated and the station director at the time said, do you want to stick around? We're, you know, we're going to do a, a, a roots music programming on, across the station. They got rid of alternative music and he knew I liked folk music. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it for a while. I needed to find a job. So I had some free time. And, you know, I stayed with it all these years, um, right. even, even while I had another career during the day. Yes. Um, but it, it, there's been so many changes in radio since those early days. Um, you know, back then we were just broadcasting to the northern New Jersey and part of New York State. We, you know, we were just a, a small little radio station. Um, but since then, with the Internet and satellite radio and everything else that's been going on in the world, um, Terrestrial radio has changed, and I could see it coming. Yeah. Um, and I had an opportunity. I was one of my day jobs. I worked in television production for, uh, for about forty years, and I was working for a company that one day they called us all in the office and said, "You know, you guys did great work, but we're closing the shop." Mm -hmm. um, and they moved everything out, and they, all of us were unemployed. So I sat down with my wife and I said, look, I always had this idea. Uh, I'm, I'm a couple of years early from retirement, but let's see if we can work this out financially. And she looked at it. She has a good job. She said, yeah, you know, you can stay home and, and, and play with radio for a while. Amazing. So uh, in 2019, I decided to launch this. Um, I launched it on May 4th, which was the 100th anniversary of Pete Seeger's birth. Yes. And, you know, it's really something uh, I, I do it from this computer, which I'm talking to you at now. I, I'm able to program it. Um, I, before I launched, I did a Kickstarter campaign to see if, you know, is there interest? Will people support this? Right. And I was astounded at the, at the response I got. Um, so many people donated, you know, there, there, there were other internet stations that were doing similar kinds, but I wasn't always happy with what they played. A lot of them were gearing more just to the more popular artists. Right. And as you know, from going to all these conferences and such, we see so many wonderful songwriters that aren't getting the attention they deserve. So let's talk about that. So yeah. how do you select the music and the musicians that you feature? 
because there's way more talent out there than you could possibly ever. Uh, ever oh, see. It, it's it's gotten harder over the years, especially mm -hmm. with uh, everybody able to be recorded at home. Doesn't mean you should record at home, but you know, <laughs> people now have that opportunity. I mean, we're getting way more songs than we possibly can. So. I have to be honest, you know, I, I listen to as much as I can. I listen to some of my peers. If they recommend an artist, I'll take a closer look. And I try to play something that I feel fits the format. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've I've got an ear for folk music, maybe because when I started back in the folk revival days, listening as a kid, right. you know, more acoustic driven, where the lyrics really stand out, where the, the words are, the poetry are what's important. So those are the kind of things I choose, but you know, I'm, I'm also trying to respond to what audiences are listening to nowadays. But how and, do you get feedback? How do you know that people really like that that performer or that song and not but, so much that one? There, there are a couple of ways. Uh, I, I get emails from listeners saying, oh, who was that you played? Can, I, can you give me some information? And I also, because we're on the internet, I can see exactly who's listening where, you know? So I know if uh, the numbers start going up and staying up, I know, hey, who did I play that hour? Uh, maybe I'll play them a little bit more. And uh, we try to work it out. And, you know, I, I look at the charts. I look at what everybody else is playing. Uh, you know, some of the best ideas you get from other people. So I, I, I try to... Sorry, go ahead. Sure. No, I was going to say, you know, the, the, the idea is that, you know, there, there's no one set definition of folk music i always look at it as such a big tent item yes. there's so many different styles so many different likes i mean i i kind of love love traditional music at my heart but i have a, a passion for singer songwriters as well yeah. and i feel they're speaking to the folk tradition as well because folk music is always about the human condition what's going on that day whether it's uh, political or um, personal or things that people can relate to and that that's right. that kind of what counts so I have a million more questions for you. Um, ah, okay, so how time consuming is this? Well, uh, this is technically my 24 seven. Yeah, and I, I kind of work, <laughs> I, I mean, this is my full-time job now. Yes. Uh, I, I'm between this, I also work for a venue here in New Jersey, the Hurdy Gurdy Folk We're Music Club. get to Hurdy Gurdy for sure, yes. And, you know, I'm doing a podcast series with Sunny Oaks, her wonderful Wisdom of the Elders series. So I, I'm keeping myself busy. Uh, this is, I don't have a day job anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is this is really it. So I'll, I kind of work at my own schedule. But I, I would say typically I do spend about eight hours a day dealing with uh, folk music in one form or another. At okay. least eight hours a day. Okay. My wife will tell you it's a lot more than that, but that's. <laughs> I would think it is. So I assume you can program in advance and then kind of push go. Yeah, okay. pretty much. It's 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 a service. I I, I contracted a service uh, for the technical end of it. They they they're out of actually Manchester, England, mm -hmm. um, and I basically program it through my computer. I can put the playlist together, all the yeah. different shows and different hosts that we have, yes. and uh, do it all in advance. So let's talk about the hosts. So you've had Angela Page and Sunny Oaks, whom I adore, and Joe Jenks, one of my dearest friends. Um, do you have any, con control is a bad word, but any um, uh, oversight as to what they pick, what they air, or do you just say, Sunny, you've got two hours, have a nice day? That's pretty much it. I mean, okay. we do try to, uh, I, I do try to convey the idea of what this channel is and something that, that fits. I've had a few people that have offered shows to me that i just didn't feel fit the, the format mm -hmm. um you know so I, I i think everybody that i've got on board has a, a like mind and again because folk music is such a diverse style or genre right. um you know i think it all fits and we try to you know put the programs uh during the evening hours uh, from all these wonderful hosts um during the day and the overnights it's our diverse playlist that goes on do you ever play something that's really outside of your lane of music that you personally like? On occasion, on, on, you know, I my show on I still do the show on WFDU every Sunday afternoon. Traditions, it's called, mm -hmm. and it's also simulcast on Folk Music Notebook. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there, I'll stretch the boundaries a bit, you know, because if it fits in with the set. Okay. Um, two weeks ago, I had a few listeners complain because, you know, it was before Thanksgiving. I said, you know, everybody's playing Alice's Restaurant. I found a version of Alice's Restaurant in Danish. 
Uh, so, you know, nobody could understand a word, but of course everybody knows Arlo's version. So that, that's probably a little closer to it. But, you know, I, I played groups like Black 47, which was an Irish uh, rock band here in New York. But, you know, I feel their style and, and what they were saying kind of fitted in with what I'm trying to say on my show. That's great. Um, you referenced social change, political lyrics and all that. Is there a limit as to, you know, outside the bounds is there? And the folk music world is pretty progressive. Yeah. Um, do you ever get someone who's with a conservative message or someone outside sort of the lane that most of us inhabit? Uh, on occasion, but I, I don't find them to be too uh, radical. Um, you know, I wouldn't play anything that, uh, or I try not to play anything that's offensive. Right. Um, you know, I, I try to, you know, maintain a sort certain moral high ground, you know, that everybody's inclusive. And if I find something that goes against that crane, I, I, I certainly wouldn't play it. But um, yeah, I mean, I've had some conservative writers out there who created songs that, you know, may have a point of view that differ from mine. Um, but you know, we let it out there. You know, th th that was another reason why I started this channel um, with terrestrial radio. Things have changed, uh, especially since uh, what's his name became what's president name? in 2016. <laughs> right. I'm sorry, I don't like to curse on the air. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the pressure became on and, and people started listening a little more intently. Yeah. I've gotten more complaints over the last few years on WFDU from listeners, which I never had before. Um, I, I did a whole set uh, on um, the women's right to choose. Mm -hmm. And a listener wrote to our station director and said, uh, how can you allow this to be on without uh, somebody else mm -hmm. having a point of view that differs? Mm -hmm. And my response is, well, give me some songs and let's see if we can play them. And of course, nothing came nothing. through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I do try to be careful on FDU because I realize I don't own that license. It's owned by the university. Right. And, you know, it's so fragile these days because of the condition. Uh, the station can't afford to have a lawsuit or anything against itself. Right. Um, but on the Internet, you know, I don't have to worry at this point, at least about the FCC. So we can be a little more. Yeah. Um, aggressive um you know i played songs with certain words that you cannot say on the uh, on the radio okay. uh, i don't make a habit of it but you know if it fits in if the if the, if the message is there yep. by all means yep uh let's talk about the impact of the coronavirus um on singer songwriters on uh we're gonna get back to the hurdy-gurdy but venues and everyone was so challenged was it good for for FMN, like did did listenership take off as people were working from home more? Talk about talk about COVID and you guys. It it, it was a double edged sword. Yeah. Um, our listenership basically tripled uh, from March to April uh, of 2020 when the when COVID fart started to hit. Amazing. When people were indoors, they had nothing to do. They discovered us. And they've stuck with us, I'm happy to say. Nice. Um, so th it's been a good thing. The, 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 the down part of it for me was that when I launched the channel, my intent was to get commercials. You know, not, not I don't want to do, you know, crazy, Eddie, weird, right, <laughs> right. every 20 minutes of commercials. But yeah. I wanted to get enough commercials that we could just support it. I'm not here to make money on this thing. I just want this thing to be sustaining. Right. And of course, a lot of what we were doing were, were venues and artists who were promoting their albums. And when they couldn't tour and the venues couldn't open, that dried up. So I ended up having to do a, um, a tip jar. Yes. And I'm amazed at everybody that's come through. We've been able to keep on the air since then. Knock on wood. You know, I think yes. things are going to look good for next year as well. Um, so it's it's been helping. But as for the music and what's been going on, I, I think it was an incredible opportunity uh, in some ways. Sure, it's sad how many people we've lost and how it's affected venues and such. Yes. But I think 
our folk community really responded. Um, I mean, right away they jumped on to you know things like Zoom and all these YouTube and Facebook concerts. Yeah. And it's gotten better. I mean, my, my day job was in television production, so I, I cringed at some of the other things I was seeing and hearing yeah. early on. Yes. But as technology advances, as people get more used to it, and as the, as artists realize it's a different medium. Um, Not I think just it's a different medium, but this isn't going to be a few weeks. Like, so I really need to invest in in amping up bad bad pun, but my sound, my lighting, my my quality. Absolutely, and and what else is happening? I think the artists are starting to realize, you know, let's be honest, you know, folk music has an older audience at its core, mm -hmm. and they're not getting out as much as they used to. And with the pandemic, it's it's gotten worse. And I know from doing radio all these years, I have a lot of people that are, are shut-ins. I've had people that have been writing to me from prison in, in, in the area who listen to the radio shows. Mm -hmm. And those folks aren't exposed to it. So now they've got an opportunity to see and hear people that um, they may not have a chance to see in person. So I think that's something that's important to yes. go forward with. So let's talk about venues um, because uh -huh. more and more venues have shuttered um, their doors or, or closed for a while. And now they're trying to reopen all that. So what have you seen and what are your prospects for hurdy gurdy and elsewhere? I, I I'm, I'm frightened for the future in, in many respects. Um, you know, the, the pandemic, we reopened, uh, last spring, uh, or this spring rather, uh, spring, spring of, of 20, 2022, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've lost money on every show that we've put on. And we've had some artists that in the past filled our theater. Yeah. yeah. And they were What's drawing. What's capacity? Uh, it's 160 seats. Okay. Um, we had one artist that was only able to draw 50 people. And, you know, she, she was really nice. She wanted to offer money back to us. But I feel when we make an agreement, we make an agreement. And we're going to honor that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how long we can continue like this. Um, and we're we're going to have a board meeting soon to discuss what our future is going to be. But we can't continue to just, you know, Hemorrhage flush money, money down the toilet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I see other venues having the same thing in our area. You know, some of them are have smaller rooms, which may be the future. House concerts, I think are doing okay, but I know people are still afraid to go into somebody's home with the pandemic still yeah. uh, in, in the midst of all of us. I mean, I think right. we can sometimes fool that it's over, but yeah. it's obviously not. Yeah, yeah. No, I talk about it a little bit as a post-pandemic world, but I, I always use the quotes, the air quotes right. or, or literal quotes if I'm writing, because it does feel like it's sort of in the rearview mirror, but it's not. Right. And, uh, yeah, I'm eager to restart my house concert series, but I'm not going to put 50 people in here. So I went to a concert the other, uh, a week ago or so, and it was, uh, I think they had 16 guests and then they also live streamed. And so it was kind of a hybrid. Sure. I, I think hybrid's going to be the future. And, you know, I think honestly, we have to, everything changes. Yeah. You know, when, when I was uh, growing up, it was, it was, people were used to going to concert halls or venues where they sat and listened, but you know, I think younger audiences, they don't want to do that. They want to go to a, a place where they can socialize. Um, you know, we have a, a wonderful club in New York City called Rockwoods Music Hall, mm -hmm. which uh, does an outstanding job in Jalopy in Brooklyn. Um, and it's a different sort of venue than I think what we were all used to. Mm -hmm. uh, so those might be the, the way things are going to be evolving. And I, I think, you know, we're kind of in an evolving period right now. And hybrid concerts certainly might be a way of helping. But I wish I had a crystal ball, not I know. maybe get some lottery numbers and uh, really <laughs> fund this whole thing. <laughs> well, let's go back to Folk Music Network here. Um, how do you market? How are people hearing about you? How are they spreading the word? How much social media do you do? How much advertising? Yeah, I uh, it's been mainly um, it's been mainly social media, uh, particularly Facebook. Um, I, I just don't have the budget to do big ad campaigns. We've we've worked with uh, organizations like Clearwater over the last festival they had when we first did, we did full page ads and that and the old songs festival. Um, but mostly it's just word of mouth. And what also amazes me, we're, it's, I had initially assumed, okay, we're gonna probably have about 95% of our audience from the US and Canada. Uh, but we've gotten a number of people that tune in from Europe, from Israel, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Australia. 
um, you know, we've got some steady listenerships in each of those countries, and it's you know, something that's global. And, and most of the music we play is geared towards U.S. and North American-based songwriters. Right. Um, but, um, I, you know, it, it's, it's hard because I wish we had more money. <laughs> I, I wish I could do advertising uh, uh, more, but, you know, mainly it's just sending out a social media on Facebook or yeah. You know, Twitter, although Twitter's got some issues these days, we're still using it. Um, but I, I don't know. I, you know, we, we just try to, to get the word out. And, and part of the issue also, because our money is limited, um, you know, we have to pay the pros, uh, the, the music rights organizations mm -hmm. to have permission to air these songs. Mm -hmm. And with Internet radio, it's based on the number of listeners you have, as well as what you make. Mm. But the more listeners that tune in, the more I have to pay out for the rights. And it's going to get to a point where we're going to be shut out. And of course, artists, rightfully so, are asking for, for a bigger cut of the pie. Right. Uh, you know, we're not Spotify by any stretch of the imagination. We don't allow downloads or anything like that. Right. But we're kind of lumped into that idea of streaming networks. So if they raise those rates, our rates get raised too. And yeah, you know, yeah. we're going to have to see what we can do to adjust. Do you archive? your shows and has it ever crashed and they, what's the worst technical challenge you've had um we've had a few t crashes um you know the tech server in england had some problems with their servers uh but not for very long you know 10 15 minutes here and there uh, and it's been I would say 99% of the time we've been on the air flawlessly since we've started. Right. Um, you know, there are always going to be technical problems. I, I worked in television for years and, and, you know, we've always had to deal with it and you just, uh, you adjust to it. Right. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we're, 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 we're holding pretty steady. I want to talk, uh, let's see, about the conferences. You and I met through music conferences. So yeah. let's talk about NERFA, the Northeast Regional Folk Alliance, and Folk Alliance International. For folks who don't know, there are regional conferences, gatherings of singer-songwriters, uh, agents, DJs, hosts, venues, uh, house concert folks, and uh, it is so inspiring and engaging. And uh, why don't you talk about how Folk Music Network um notebook. those conferences sorry folk music notebook notebook i'm sorry i didn't know <laughs> that uh, folk okay. music notebook, uh uses those to find new artists and to enhance your visibility well uh i've been going to nerfa for 23 24 years now mm -hmm. and to me it's an annual booster shot i mean when i when i first went i was dividing my time with my my day job which was getting really difficult i had a co-host at the time and uh because i couldn't do it every week uh but really once i became exposed to what nerfa is the northeast regional folk alliance conference uh, i discovered so many wonderful artists um and it continues to this day the, the recent one we were at was in atlantic city and there was close to 500 people there i'm gonna say asbury park not asbury atlantic park city uh, oh yes. It and I'm a Jersey boy too. Yeah, I just... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And the and the formal showcases were at the Stone Pony, and you and I both each got to be on stage at that yeah. historic venue that that launched Bruce Springsteen and so many others. And yeah, so right. keep going. Sorry. Right. No, I'm sorry. Uh, but it, uh, you know, this year in particular, uh, there were a lot of new faces, a lot of new music that I heard. And I ran showcase rooms, which I'm going to be putting online uh, so everybody can watch. Yeah. Um, but it's it's incredible because to me i've always said folk music is a living tradition and these conferences not only just showcase these these artists but they help develop operational plans for the future uh for both artists and for you know folk music notebook um i attended a couple of workshops there a bit about live streaming and i'm hoping to do some live streaming events we have a youtube page folk it's youtube.com slash folk music notebook um, we i started a series called artist and resident showcase where i give artists 15 minute slots each week to uh, record a video at home we started this during the pandemic and now with all the uh, showcases that i recorded at nerfa i'm going to incorporate that into it uh, but anyway you know the conference uh you know, especially now when everything is so different and changing. I think we need conferences like this so people can share best practices. Um, that's where ideas are formed and it's, I, it's been a huge help for me. Yes. 
I Nerfa is my favorite weekend of the year. And like you said, sort of the the booster shot, the the energizer, the inspiration. I I look forward to it all year. Uh, and I have to give a little shout out to my YouTube channel, Folk and Great Music, and my Facebook page. And I have shared uh, and posted and am sharing. They're all uploaded my Nerfa showcase uh, videos. So um, I want to I want to wrap up, but I can't end without talking about Vic and Reba Heyman. Um, whom you honor with an hour each day and sunny oaks. So just some of the some of the real patrons and supporters and um and revered um yeah leaders sure. in our community. Well um I I first met Vic and Reba at Nerfo one year we Vic were and Reba uh, Heyman. Vic and Reba Heyman. Yeah. Um they're I guess from from probably from your neck of the woods. From my uh, district. They were constituents and friends. Uh, yeah. Well, they hosted some wonderful concerts and they were incredible supporters of music. Oh, um, we were on the formal showcase committee at Nerfa, which is where I first got to know them. We were reviewing all of these artists and I, I got to see how, how much they loved and supported these artists. Yes. There, was, there was one woman I remember, um, unfortunately, I don't know whatever happened to her. She kind of dropped off the map, but they had t-shirts made with her picture on and oh. they showed up at the showcase uh, to support her. And I was just so moved by them. And, you know, after Vic passed, uh, Reba kind of kept, kept, kept going. Yeah. And, and she was a huge supporter for Folk Music Notebook. Um, nice. Both financially, she made some donations, and also for her emails of encouragement and conversations that we ha had. And when she passed, I was just so shocked. And her family has, has uh, kept up her, her tradition. You know, I know they do annual concerts. and. Yeah. Um, and also supporting Folk Music Notebook as well, because I, you know, I think it was something that she enjoyed so much. Her daughter used to tell me every day at five o'clock she would tune on Folk Music Notebook and uh, just sit there and listen and you know, talk about the artists that she was hearing. Hey, Judy. So, yeah. so, they, so they were they were incredible people. And and Sunny Oaks, what Bless can you her. say about Sunny? She is uh, just a, a dream. I, I met her at least 40 years ago when she was so let's her. say who sunny oaks is sunny oaks is the uh the sister of phil oaks but i'd like to say if phil was still around people would be referring to phil as the brother of sunny oaks yes because she has done so much for our folk community um as i said when i first met her she was part of the hudson river sloop singers which was a a group of artists who worked with the clearwater organization singing songs and it was a you know loose-knit choir so to speak uh, she hosted a radio show on WFMU in, uh, in Orange, New Jersey, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, you know, we became friends and I, I think our friendship really started to, to get together at NERFA mm -hmm. and it was at NERFA back in 2010 she started this uh, series called Wisdom of the Elders, mm -hmm. where she would get three individuals elder members of our folk community, if you want to call them that age is always to be something that's uh, nebulous. Uh, but she would bring three people together who had some connection. And they did these remarkable panel discussions. Yeah. And they were all recorded and they just kind of were sitting uh, on a shelf. Uh, no one hearing them after they originally took place at Nerfa. So I got I got Sonny interested in an idea. Let's resurrect these old shows, take out them from the archive, make a podcast, nice. and we'll do new ones. So we're doing that. And she was also she continued her radio work all these years. She uh, was basically about to retire, and I said, you know, Sonny, I've got this folk music notebook thing. We could uh, work something out here. You know, you don't even have to go to the studio. You can do it from your 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 kitchen. Perfect. And, and so we record her introductions. She sends me all the music and we put this program together, which is once a month on the fourth Sunday of the month at 6 p.m. Eastern time. And it's just incredible. And and over the years, Sonny has done so much for folk music. I mean, I think I, she's... Have, to, I have to weigh in. So first <laughs> off, you just presented her um, at NERFA with the Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes. And unfortunately, she wasn't able to attend, but your tribute to her was so lovely. And I just want to add that she has helped keep her late brother's music alive because Phil Oaks was one of the early just inspirations for me about folk music uh, and his songs of political change. Um, and if listeners, viewers aren't familiar with Phil Oaks, it's O-C-H-S. And you've got to listen to some of his music. It's so powerful. And she has helped keep it alive with uh, with performances with Emma's Revolution and and um, 
and it was Brother Sum, but with Greg Greenway, with John Flynn, with David Roth, with Emma's Revolution, with, I mean, just yeah. unbelievable folks um, making sure that the music continues and his, oh, his stay alive. Sonia, yeah, yeah, Reggie yeah. Harris, and yeah. And the list goes on. It's been the list goes on. Yeah. But she, she's also, uh, you know, allowed the others, all of these artists to perform their own songs as well and show yes. how Phil's music is carrying on. So it's yes. it's great what she's been doing. And it's now, uh, we do an annual of, of Phil Oaks song night on the uh, Greenwich Village Folk Festival, which is another event I'm involved yes. in. It's an yes. online concert. Yes. So yeah, she, she's, she's doing well. She's not traveling like she used to, but you know, she was a fixture. I think she's been either a volunteer, MC, or stage manager just at practically every major folk festival in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, just an incredible woman. That's great. So, Ron Olesko, we need to wrap up, and it's time for us to do the fast five. Uh -oh. so five quick questions to um, to let folks get to know you better. Um, so, Ron Olesko, founder and director of Folk Music Notebook. Um, question number one. What is your favorite genre that is not folk music that you would choose to listen to? Well, it depends what day you ask me this. Um, I, I like alternative music too. I mean, I, I mean, and I have my, I, th I think they always say when you're uh, listening to as a teenager is what sticks with you. So I, I have a fondness for music like Talking Heads, the Ramones, some of the early okay. punk music too. All right. Briefly, that's five. Question two. Uh, who was your or is your mentor or role model? Um, Marjorie Guthrie. Nice. And, you know, there's others, Gene Shea, Sonny, so many, but Marjorie's really what inspired me. Awesome. Question three. Do you have a song that's your anthem, a song that really inspires you and lifts you up? That's impossible for me to answer. Every day I've got a different song. Uh, Pastures of Plenty was one song that always sticks with me. Uh, By whom? There, uh, Woody Guthrie. Phil Thank Oaks you. there, but for Fortune. that That's another one that's strongly with me. Yeah, good. Uh, question number four. Ron, you are such a nice guy, and you seem so kind all the time. What ticks you off? Um, lying. People who uh, you know can't really handle the truth or tell the truth mm -hmm. you know, that uh, let's be honest and open with one another good i like it and the fifth question the one that i ask everyone ron alesco the founder and director of folk music notebook what is your hidden secret superpower what is a skill or talent something you're really good at that most folks can't do well, you can probably tell by looking at me. I like to cook, <laughs> I, I, especially baking. I, I I I was making sourdough bread long before it became a thing during the pandemic. So that that's probably my secret skill. There you go. Well, it's awesome. Well, Ron, thank you for all you do for music, for musicians, for building community, and for the joy that you bring into every room and every uh, airing of uh, of shows that you do it's always a joy to hear you and see you so well, thank you for taking time to kibitz today thank you cheryl and the feeling is mutual you do such an amazing job not only in the folk music community but what you're doing for maryland i wish you were here in new jersey because i would vote for you <laughs> often you know? <laughs> Uh, they right, do that right. in New Jersey. We don't right, really right. do it in Maryland. <laughs> it's a thing, right? <laughs> I look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Cheryl. Take care, huh? Bye. Bye.